First of all, let me thank you for the opportunity to be here at the Heart Congress 2023, even if it's virtual. But I'm Helena Correia. I'm from uh, Santa Maria Hospital in Lisbon, Portugal. And it's with a great honor that I present you today, coronary artery fistula, a case report. I do not have any potential conflict of interest to declare. So let's start with the clinical history of our, of our patient. It's a 72 years old male with multiple cardiac risk factors such as hypertension, dyslipidemia, a pharma smoker. He had the previous PCI of the LED and concerning to the left ventricle ejection fraction, it was preserved. The symptoms at the time were hemoptysis. Let's look up at the coronary angiography. You can see that we have two fistulas, one coming out from the proximal segment of the circumflex and the other one with the origin at the proximal segment of the right coronary artery. But before we are going through what we have done to this patient, let's talk a little bit about coronary artery fistulas. It's a rare congen congenital anomaly and not only congenital, we will see, but the incidence of the, these fistulas on the coronary arteries are from 0.1 to 0.2 in the population, so it's very low. And normally we diagnose, diagnose these uh, fistulas at uh, uh, the coronary and geography by accident, but also in non-invasive cardiac imaging exams, we can also find out these fistulas. And the majority of them are congenital, but they can be the result of one of these procedures, such as intracardiac device implantation, cardiac surgery, myocardial biopsy, and also direct chest trauma. So not only congenital. And 20% of these patients have not one, but two or more fistulas, as we can see in our uh, the clinical case I just showed you, the coronary angiogram, they, he has like two uh, uh, coronary artery fistulas. So that's normally the presentation of these patients, in 20% of them at least. So for the indication for closure, um, there are doubts about it, and we will see uh, through this uh, presentation how we can do it and how we can decide it. So the first closure were made by uh, Rady and his companions in 1983 with a detachable balloon, but with the considerable advances of the technology, of course, um, they have been made interventional devices for this purpose, such as coils and also closure devices. Uh, the data supporting this closure are limited to small cases series. So we don't have guidelines. We don't have uh, this big multicentrical uh, studies. So what we have is this small case series, but that is normal because also the incidence of these cases are very small. So that's why. But in 2019, the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association, they updated their guidelines and they emphasize in these guidelines, the importance of the heart team approach. So cardiac surgeons, interventionists, uh, they should talk and see each case, but we will see why. So this is a diagram that uh, Al EG published in the American College Cardiology uh, Journal in 2021. And let's go through the diagram. So when we have a coronary fistula, if it's not symptomatic, if it's not large, if it's not medium, so if it's not, we can monitorize the patient and we can control them and, and follow up them from three to five years and see if the fistulas are the same or if there was any alteration on it. But if we have a large fistula, which is two times bigger than the vessel, or a medium fistula, which is from one to two times bigger than the the, the the native vessel and symptomatic and then yes we should think about surgical uh, closure or maybe trans catheter closure so if it's good uh, for surgery and there's no indication for trans catheter closure then we should check if there is a coronary aneurysm if there is maybe we can do a surgical closure and a bypass graft. 
But if it, there's not an aneurysm, so we can just do the surgical, surgical closure. But if the indication is not for surgery, but is for transcatheter closure, if it's feasible, it, if it is complex, we can check which approach we should go through, if it's a venous approach or if it's an arterial approach. And if, if we have a simple anatomy, we just have to check if it's a proximal origin or if it's a distal origin. If it's the proximal origin, we can, we can consider it the arterial approach. So just going through the coronary arteries. But if it's distal, maybe we should consider it a venous excess. So if these attempts are not successful, maybe in the future we can retry to close these fistulas. And if we are successful, we should follow up the patients also. So we should reimagine them from one to five years and be very careful with the symptoms and with the clinical presentation of the patient. And concerning about uh, the proximal origin or the distal origin, we have different ap approaches. In this case, let's focus on the proximal origin of the fistulas because it's the clinical case I bring you. So we should also always go through the arterial access and then try to close it with coils. Uh, it can be a large fistula, so we can consider a closer device, a plug, or if it's a normal uh, vessel, we can actually uh, deploy a coil. Let's see then. There are very uh, different um, devices that we can put. We have vascular pl plugs, we have perishable coils, detachable coils, and stent grafts. Um, we choose in this case a detachable coil and precisely the azure but still normally when the the, the complications and the disadvantage of it is that one normally it's not enough so we need to put two or even more and still the fistula is not closed so that's the disadvantage of the coils uh, concerning to the outcomes these five studies showed that the coils are the, the device that normally are used and the success of the procedures are very good. And about, oh, sorry, about the complications, we can see that normally there are recanalizations of the fistulas, maybe sometimes the coil embolization, but not that, not the major event. So let's go again to, to the clinical case that I brought you here today. So as you can see, we used um, a Judkins, a right Judkins guide uh, catheter, and we advanced a hydrophilic guide wire through the fistula. Then we put a fine cross, a microcatheter, and through the microcatheter, we deployed the coil. As you can see, we deployed the coil at the right coronary artery, and it was not enough. So what we decided was to put a second coil. And still, we were looking at it. And the fistula are still uh, with the um, flow. So it was not that good. But still, we decided not to do anything else at this time. Because sometimes when you go and you you catheterize the patient again, the fistula are, are closed. So we decided to give it a time. And then one week later, we attempt to close the right coronary fistula again because it was not closed already. And as you can see, we put a third coil and still there was flow on the fistula. So we gave it a time. Actually, we were with uh, some kind of help of the radiography, the, the radiologists, and they said that normally we have to wait from 20 minutes to 40 minutes to have a result. So what we decided to do, it was to go through the, um, the circumflex and try to close the circumflex and then check it out on the right. And as you can see here, same thing. We had um, a guiding catheter. We put a guide wire on the uh, first marginal optos just to, to, to have the, the vessel uh, preserved. And then the same thing for this fistula. We pass a guide wire then the fine cross, then took the guide wire and deployed it 
a, um, a coil as you can see. And we wait for 40 minutes for one side and for the other side and check this out. The right coronary fistula is closed, no flow after the coils. And also on the circumflex, there's no flow after the one coil that we uh, implanted. So perfect. So as final considerations, we can say that coronary artery fistulas are commonly congenital, but they can be, and you can find acquired forms. The incidence on population are very low. So it's not every day that can find out a case like this. When clinical indicated transcatheter closure is an effective treatment for selected medium and large or symptomatic coronary artery fistulas, as we have seen, Coronary fistulas are frequently and anatomically very complex because they are like with these curves and it's very complicated sometimes to access them. And it, they require the use of specialized techniques and also e equipment that sometimes we don't have at our labs. Um, therefore, these interventions are best performed in specialized pro centers, of course, because they have of course, more cases performed and also material. The complications of this approach are not very well established, but it, they can happen, of course. Perforation, embolization of the coils, um, dissections, of course, it can happen. All patients with coronary artery fistula should undergo through a follow-up, not only because there can be embolization of the coils, it can uh, happen the recanalization re of the fistula. So we should follow up these patients uh, very good. Patients with large coronary arteries and fistulas and aneurysms are best treated with concomitant surgical bypass and anticoagulation. Until now, however, there's no consensus on optimal strategy for the management of these patients due to the lack of controlled trials or official guidelines, because that's what it is. We don't have guidelines. This is just um, good people that share the, their cases with the world so we can see what, what we are doing and which is the best way to treat each patient. And that's why I'm here to presenting, presenting you this clinical case. So actually we can discuss uh, uh, about this and which, um, we, what we should and what we can do to help these patients. Thank you so much.